In the next 100 years, we can expect human population to reach 11 billion people. Is this something that is sustainable? So I, I don't know what the future is going to hold. I'm just pretty sure that we either get sustainability and we move into the next generation, or we screw that up and know, know us pretty much. So it's. Uh, it sounds a little fearful, doesn't it? It's like a, a, the doomsaying model, I think, is, is not good. That works with some people, but with others who don't, who are not convinced that this is true, they'll do just the opposite. Terraform One is a nonprofit organization. We are interested in pushing the boundaries of ecological design and thinking of the future of our cities. Whether it's waste, uh, climate, transportation, architecture, we approach those things through a design research process, which is very interdisciplinary. We bring in smart researchers with backgrounds from art to design, technology, and business as well. And we try to put people together to see what sort of solutions we can discover through the process. We really like to push certain boundaries to be very extreme, but we also at the same time try to come up with ideas that could be built today. We were asked by this gallery to come up with an idea for an emergency shelter. So we actually thought of merging the need to create food with the need to have an emergency shelter. It's for people in some kind of crisis, either from an earthquake or a flood, that don't have access to the protein they need to survive and to have a healthy diet, and don't have access to shelter. So what we've done is we've kind of controlled this geometry to make a beautiful shelter that's easy to unpack and assemble. And inside it, we found these very off-the-shelf parts, these kinds of jugs for holding water or for holding and housing crickets. You unscrew one of these points, and uh, you'd be able to pull out a bunch of crickets, uh, you put them into a bowl, and with a pistol and mortar, ground them into cricket flour, and it's an amazing source of protein. So what you're seeing here is this project called the Plug-in Ecology, the Urban Farm Pod. And it's this giant sphere that's made of a, a rotegrity structure, which is essentially flat packing panels that when uh, unfolded and connected into one another, they form this perfect sphere. And inside that sphere is a series of panels that's meant to grow plants, plants of all kinds. And the thought is, is that you'd be able to, at home or in some other condition, uh, grow your salad. So what's super cool about this project is it's essentially a chair that's entirely grown. All of the material that you see here is essentially mycelium, or it's the root base of mushroom, or reishi, that's grown within seven days from agricultural waste into this hardened surface. Not only could it be used for a chair, but you can imagine this having all kinds of architectural properties for acoustical tiling, uh, for insulation systems, etc. When I'm done with a chair like this, five, ten years worth of use, I could throw it into a garden and it feeds thousands of other forms of life. As an architect growing up in the age of deconstruction, we were basically all black, were very dark and creepy, used forms that were super exciting but didn't really make sense as far as a relationship to people. It was architecture for architect's sake. And I thought, well, you know, there are grand challenges that our society uh, is facing. And I think that architects certainly have the imagination and the skill set and the capacity to tackle some of those challenges. And one of the biggest ones is climate dynamics. We actually had been doing all kinds of studies to look at flooding conditions in New York City, especially in Brooklyn, uh, long before Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we did this one project that looks at adapting ghost fleets of former military ships and vessels and using them 
uh, alongside our shores or the edges of our cities between the East River and also the Hudson River to create a buffer zone to absorb the impact of climate dynamics, to absorb these large surges or charges of water that we're expected to get more often in flooding conditions in New York City. Today in New York, we have this hard line between nature and city. We almost ignore our beautiful waterways to some extent. And I think the way we've engaged that is thinking about how we can deal with transportation systems, but also think about the impact of that water affecting all the different kind of real estate along that edge and how we can create a relationship and a logic that's using resilient methods so that we can move into the next century and consider the flooding, consider the rising waters, consider what's happening with our climate. Growth. Growth is the overriding predicate that I think is affecting us and it's affecting how we deal with the Earth's resources. We expect unlimited growth all the time, everywhere. You've never seen a leader get elected by saying, I'm gonna shrink the economy, create less jobs, and you'll, you will all have less stuff. It's always the opposite way. Except for we have a finite limit to the amount of resources we can extract. So you can't grow endlessly. So I think in the design world, we need to be accountable for this, because we're the ones that are giving shape to all those resources that are coming out of the earth. But if we're confronted with a real crisis, something super ugly, it's possible for us to retool how we think about our economy and our energy systems and everything that relates to it, and that we have the capacity and the science and the technology to do it. We just need the will.